Now we are officially recording. Okay, so what we're playing with here is a fairly simple recipe. Um, the only thing, it's a recipe for, called sour orange chicken. It's out of uh, the uh, uh, Wusla, uh, Kitab al Wusla il al Habib, translated by Charles Perry as scents and flavors, which is actually what those words mean. Um, and uh, like I said, it's a fairly simple recipe. Um, it's basically fried chicken, and then you pour sort of an orange flavored syrup over it to you know, give it a nice glaze and some more flavor. Um, the key issue here is the right kind of oranges. And there are some other issues as well, which we can you know, touch on. Um, but right now, let me see if, uh, okay, getting a little bit of a sizzle there. So it's trying to add the chicken. And remember, when you're working with food, wash your hands first. Wash early, wash often. And in the interest of not having to wash my hands again anytime soon, so some comments on the tools I'm using to cook with. I'm using um, pottery, a pottery uh, skillet here. I don't know if uh, people can see that as I've got it tilted here. But uh, these things are relatively easily available. There's a whole, uh, there's actually a whole Facebook group dedicated to cooking with clay. It's mostly people making bean dishes. But uh, it's a good place to go if you want to figure out where to get clay cookware. You know, also, uh, within our game, we have a certain number of people who make the stuff. I will admit, I did not get this from somebody who makes this stuff within our game. But this is a basically a North African, Southern European skillet. Uh, now I'm cooking on an, electric, uh, on an electric range. You should never put these uh, clay cookware directly on one of these glass cooktops or even the coil type. What you want to do is use a, something like this, heat distributor. They're pretty easy to find. You know, mo most food and cooking, most uh, uh, cooking type places sell the things. Hardware stores have them. Like I said, pretty easy to find. So we're going to let the chicken fry. It's going to be doing that for a while. Um, and I have some uh, uh, some water and sugar set on another burner that uh, should be uh, coming to a boil soon. And the recipe says cook it to, to the consistency of a beverage syrup. And I really don't know exactly what they mean by that. <laughs> you know, they, they, I, I have no sense of um, what they're talking about there. So. What am I doing? I'm just making a simple syrup, which is 50-50 water and sugar. So a cup of water, a cup of sugar, you know, however much you want. So once all the sugar dissolves, uh, I'm gonna throw in the pulp from uh, Seville orange. Um, Seville oranges are kind of interesting fruit. They are the ancestor of the modern orange, of all the varieties of modern orange. They are very tart, and they are very, very seedy. So you cut one of these things open and it's got like a bajillion seeds. And if you taste the juice from it, it's as sour or most more so than lemon juice. It's a pretty interesting stuff. Um, 
These are only available for about three weeks in March, late February, early March or so. And that's the only time you can get them, at least around here. Um, I know some folks in the I know some folks in the California who actually have civil orange trees in their yards. So uh, lucky them, I guess. But uh, but in any case, so um, I have a cutting board right here. Just a moment ago, what did I do with it? I walked someplace else with it. So interestingly, a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, medieval cookbooks that uh, talk about using Seville oranges um, indicate that the person who is removing the pulp should be different from the person who's peeling it because the flavor in the rind is so bitter you don't want to get it in with the uh, pulp. So uh, I'm going to deal with that just by washing my hands. So, so like I said, wash early, wash often. <laughs> But as you're peeling, it, it looks it looks like an ordinary orange. You know, if anybody can't see it, you know, let me know. Uh, but once you cut it open, you realize this is real different. I've known. Um, see, she hasn't uh, she hasn't been around this part of the country for a while. How many people remember uh, remember Allison Gray? Um, well, she used to do all this stuff with the, uh, you know, with sugar work and, uh, you know, basically making very high end, uh, very high end, uh, you know, subtleties and things like that. And she at one point asked me if I could get my hands on some Seville oranges for her. She was living in Pennsylvania at the time, and Pennsylvania has very restrictive laws apparently, and they couldn't get Seville oranges there. So I got her a whole bunch, and she uh, made a very, very flavorful candied orange peel. Um, by the way, this is the kind of oranges that they make orange marmalade from, but, uh, because it's, it's got a lot more intense flavor than your standard oranges. I've seen, you know, within the game, I've seen a lot of people deciding to substitute for this stuff uh, by using uh, blood oranges. That is not a good substitute. Why? Because blood oranges are sweet. I mean, you know, people have the experience of eating blood oranges. Yes? No? If you've had experience of eating blood oranges, you know they're sweet. Very, very sweet. Very sweet. Um, these are not sweet. Like I said, they're quite tart. So I'm just going to cut the thing open and remove some of the seeds. Ooh, I seem to have lucked out here. This one uh, does not have so many seeds in it. Maybe it's just that half. Yeah, I've really lucked out here. But the last, uh, the last one of these I used, which was a week or so ago, uh, I opened the thing up, and it was scary how many seeds there were in the thing. Like 30 seeds. Or so in a single orange. So I'm just removing the membrane because we're just going to dump the entire bit of pulp into the sugar syrup once it once it starts coming to a, a nice little boil. So one of the other things I have cooking over here um, is I've got some um, farro, uh, you know, as it's known in Italy. It's basically uh, emmer wheat. So I'm cooking that as a starch. Um, some entertaining comments about using that kind of grain uh, is that uh, emmer wheat and most of the uh, whole grain wheats, um, if you eat them as a whole grain, which you can do, no problem, um, they will make you very regular. You know, they... Uh, uh, one uh, scholarly article used the term strong purgative properties. 
Well, by golly, they're right, because I've eaten this stuff and I've had the experience. <laughs> So uh, one other comment I'll make, uh, you know, while I'm waiting for this to boil and, you know, while I'm trying the chicken and such. Um, so it says fry the chicken. It doesn't specify what kind of oil. So this being the Middle East, what kind of oil would you expect them to be using? Olive oil. They might also have used sesame seed oil. We are not talking about the... East Asian toasted sesame seed oil. We're talking about raw sesame seed oil. Um, toasted sesame seed oil. Um, I, had, I had a very entertaining conversation with Kerry Doc about that. He tried doing something with uh, toasted sesame seed oil and said, uh, kind of ruined the dish. But yeah, no, you don't want to use that. You want to use uh, the raw stuff. If you live in the right part of the country, it's very easy to get this stuff cheaply because... Uh, they sell it at South Asian markets. It's called the uh, uh, Gingeli oil. Yeah, so you got to kind of have to figure out uh, the uh, you know linguistic differences. But Gingeli oil, you know, you can buy a decent sized quantity and it's pretty inexpensive. Whereas if you go into your local shop, right, or stop and shop, or whatever your local grocery store is, and you look for sesame oil on the shelves, chances are it's going to be organic. And you'll get like maybe a, a quart bottle of the stuff and or or less, maybe about a pint bottle. And it'll cost like, you know, nine, ten dollars. Of course, for nine, ten dollars, you can probably get a half, practically get a half gallon of uh, this stuff from a South Asian grocery. So the. Um, The uh, sugar syrup is forming up nicely. I'm doing this in a copper pot. That's one of the recommended tools for do, doing sugar work, even uh, back in period. Um, I am going to use uh, wooden spoons. You don't really want, want to use metal on metal here. So that's one of the things that we're that we're doing here is uh, using um, you know, olive oil or sesame oil. In this case, I'm using olive oil. Now, here's the thing: in modern cookery, almost every recipe you see that calls for olive oil is going to tell you to use what kind of olive oil. Anybody wants to chime in? Extra virgin olive oil. Do not use extra virgin olive oil. Okay. Extra virgin olive oil is special stuff. Uh, it's it's used as a finishing oil, it's used for all kinds of purposes, but one does not cook in extra virgin olive oil. One cooks in like pure olive oil, and they knew the difference back in period. You know, they would press out the, the uh, 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 extra virgin, and then they'd press it out again. You know, they had all kinds of different kinds of olive oils for different purposes. So I just use... Uh, you know, a lower end olive oil, and that's perfectly adequate for our purposes. Um, the other thing is that, um, mm -hmm. so if you go out to your local grocery store and you buy a whole chicken, um, on average, about what does a whole chicken weigh? Anybody? It's about three pounds. Oh, that's that. Yeah. I don't know about your grocery grocery stores around me. They're all like five pounds. Okay. Uh, you know, they're huge. Um, they're huge. They have they have huge tracts of land, shall we say? Yeah. The, the 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 breasts on those birds are enormous, and I've been told that they are the breasts on those birds are so big that as they're you know growing up and approaching uh, the end of their lives. They can't walk. They fall on their faces because there's so much mass up front. Um, yeah, it's kind of scary when you think about it, actually. <laughs> so, um, so what do you do? Well, you get chickens that are closer to what you just mentioned, about around three pounds or so. Um, those chickens 
are not easy to find. Um, I've seen them at uh, Afro-Caribbean type grocery stores around where I work in Manhattan. Um, of course, it'll be a while before I can get back into one of those. Uh, um, I've also seen them at uh, halal grocery stores uh, near me. You can actually uh, buy them as low as two pounds, which is amazing. You know, so you've got these nice small chickens. Also, another uh, variety of small chicken um, is um, something that goes by the fancy name of rock Cornish game hens. Those are not those are those are not game hens. Those are chickens. Those are you know, small young chickens, and uh, they also work well for this kind of thing. Um, they're considerably smaller. They weigh about a pound, pound and a half each, but you know they're fine for uh, uh, some purposes. So um, so my uh, sugar and water solution has uh, dissolved completely. So I'm going to start throwing in the uh, uh, the orange pulp. Now there's an interesting thing about the recipe um, that I just realized yesterday as I was reading it that. So maybe the way in which I've been interpreting it isn't quite what, or what they intend, or what the author of the cookbook intended. Um, let, me, uh, let me pull up the recipe and read it, and uh, we can walk through the interpretation of the thing. You can see what I mean. So the recipe says, take orange or the, uh, or the sour part of citron. We'll circle back to citron in a little bit. Extract the pulp, mix into syrup, thicken to the consistency of beverage syrup. Fry the chicken and add. Okay, so here's a question. Do you add the chicken to the syrup or do you add the syrup to the chicken? Doesn't say, we don't know. Um, I have been adding the syrup to the chicken. Uh, fry the chicken and add. This is an unusual dish. When serving, and here's what you know, sort of makes you think a little bit. Plate the chicken and garnish with citron or orange flesh all over, on the breast and sides and underneath. So I look at that and I think to myself, are they talking about a whole chicken? So when you when they say fry the chicken, are they talking about frying a whole chicken, browning a whole chicken? Are they talking about taking that whole chicken and just immersing it in a pot full of syrup. I don't know. You know. I just realized this yesterday as I was looking at this. Hmm. I wonder what would happen if I were to try that. Um, this will have to wait a year because that means I'll have to make a whole lot of sugar syrup and you can't get civil oranges anymore. They're, the, they're gone you know, for the season. Even if you could find Someplace that was uh, that ordinarily sells the things that would carry the things that there aren't any around here. They're all in Manhattan. You know, it's either uh, the Afro Caribbean market or something like that. So, um, so I've got the uh, sour orange pulp in here. I'm going to add some more pieces. Uh, I have a little little bit of a problem um, uh, right about now. Um, I actually uh, was uh, a bit ill, you know, whether it was coronavirus or what, you know, who knows, you know, enough so that my doctor put me under quarantine for a couple of weeks, which is, thank God, over and done with. Um, but one of the uh, side effects of having been ill for a bit is I've lost my sense of taste for well, most of it. That's it which uh, is kind of a nuisance when you're a food and cooking person. Like, so um, I'm kind of faking it here, but I'm, I have enough experience that I can get away with faking it. It's kind of like, you know, you know, kind of like the stories you hear about Beethoven composing the ninth while he was deaf. <laughs> you know, he could hear it in his head. <laughs> you know, not that I'm anywhere near that... Uh, not that I'm anywhere near Beethoven level as a food and cooking geek, but uh, yeah, but you get the idea. Mm 
So the chicken's browning nicely here. You, know, you, you actually want it to be getting fairly close to done. One of the things that I'm going to do that's a variation on the recipe, you'll notice if, if you look at the recipe, that it's got no spices in it. The only flavoring is just the orange and the sugar. Um, you know, I shouldn't say no spices because back in the day, sugar was considered a spice. Um, has no spices, no salt. So, you know, just uh, the uh, salt that would be associated with the, uh, with the meat itself, and that's about it. Um, so I'm going to add a few things to just give it a little bit more flavor um, or but I'm not going to do that until after I add the syrup. So one of the things I'm going to add is coriander. Um, you might ask, why coriander? Um, how many people have cooked with coriander? A little bit of experience with it? I have. Yeah. Um, so you know the relationship between coriander and cilantro. Okay, so coriander is the seed, cilantro is the... Uh, um, one of the interesting things about coriander is that it blends real well with citrus flavors. Um, brewers especially, like modern brewers, use it a fair bit. You can find a lot of beers, modern beers, that are flavored with orange peel and coriander. So I thought, hey, you know what? Coriander is a period spice. They used it in this part of the world. Cooks were creative, and they, and they would do things. So I'm going to be adding a little bit of coriander. Uh, once uh, the uh, sauce gets, uh, once the syrup gets going. Um, but I'm not going to add it until after I pour the syrup over the chicken. But one of the things that the syrup is going to do is it'll cause the chicken to brown very nicely. Because you know, that's one of the things that sugar does is it uh, increases uh, uh, the browning action. You can get, have a whole interesting conversation about food chemistry and uh, food science in here about that. You know, we'll talk about the Maillard reaction and all that lovely stuff. Uh, but yeah, I... I used to um, I used to pan fry uh, you know back before I you know, was keeping kosher. I used to pan fry pork chops, and I'd sprinkle a little bit of sugar on each uh, side of the pork chop, and it would make it brown very nicely. And you can do that with lots of different foods. And and now that I mention medieval food and cooking, I find sprinkling sprinkling a little bit of sugar on something is a very period thing to do. Do folks have any questions about the process that we're undergoing here? And I want to give you know give people a chance to talk to me if they want to. So I have a question about the sink thing. Um, so do you think they used salt and pepper, or then they just didn't put it in the recipe because they took it for granted? They might have just taken it for granted, and I'm not taking it for granted. I'm you know uh, uh, I'm I'm saying hey, I'm going to add some spices. Now, the, the thing is, I, I, I've had some fascinating conversations with people about this. Um, the thing is, it's, uh, it's likely that they used um, some kind of, uh, uh, that there was some freedom in the recipes for the chef to do whatever they wanted. Um, but some people have argued rather vigorously, that that only applies to other parts of the world. In the Middle Eastern, in the uh, Islamic, early Islamic cookbooks, uh, generally they give you precise instructions and you should follow the precise instructions. Um, uh, th this is a conversation I've had with uh, uh, Karyadoc on a number of occasions. Actually, not Karyadoc, but his daughter. You know, she's <laughs> argued very vigorously for no, 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 you shouldn't add anything that isn't specifically uh, included in the recipe. And, say, 
you know, I'm going to disagree with you on that. <laughs> I think there's a, a lot more room for interpretation than you're allowing. I'm going to take just a little bit of this and Yeah, tar. This one's actually um, sweeter than many. Not sure what's up with that. So you're not including the membrane in the sauce. I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean the membrane is it's just fiber. It's, uh, you know, you know, what I want is the orange flavor more than anything else. Now, one of the entertaining things about cooking with a uh, copper pot that has metal handles is it gets really hot really <laughs> fast. <laughs> you know, you know anything about the uh, you know heat capacity of metals and such? Copper conducts, you know, copper conducts electricity and it conducts heat and it conducts both equally well. <laughs> so you can really uh, fry your hands on. Uh, or, in my case, I had this experience once, I made the mistake of pouring myself a cup of coffee in a copper goblet. <laughs> this was a bad experience. I think a lot of us have done that at Penzik. <laughs> yeah, well, this was like a, you, know, you can get these copper goblets that are lined. Uh, this was not a lined copper goblet. This was a 100% copper goblet. And I really, Burned my lips freeze. This was at um, actually at uh, what was it uh, the um, the uh, um, fifty year celebration. Mm. Uh, the the one uh, uh, up uh, by Albany, uh, the East Kingdom fifty year. I didn't manage to make it out to the uh, SCA fifty year. Alfredo. How high do you have your temperature set on your burners? Well, uh, I've got the right front up to about medium high. Um, the uh, the uh, uh, ferro is uh, more uh, more medium. I'm actually going to turn it down at this point because it's uh, I don't want it to boil too vigorously. Um, because I'm, you know, doing the whole syrup thing, you know, I I had this up fairly high and then I turned it down. Because once it, once you get to a simmer, you just want to leave it at a simmer. The chicken's frying and you fry at a relatively high temperature on the one hand. On the other hand, you want to be careful that you don't crank it up too high because you're cooking in pottery. So... Uh, I have uh, used this thing on a, a charcoal brazier, and it works really, really nicely. But the weather isn't conducive to that right now. So this particular Seville orange was... Um, a lot juicier and a lot had a lot more pulp in it than uh, uh, I'm used to seeing. Kind of surprised me there. Uh, no worries. What it means is that uh, I'll be uh, using the remainder of it as the garnish that's called for in the recipe. Remember, it says take the uh, you know take bits of the pulp and you know spread it around the chicken. So that's what I'll be doing with that. But one thing that I'll probably do once I add the sauce is I'll probably put a lid on this just to try and hold in some of the steam and you know, speed up the cooking process. So, that cooking on clay is slower than cooking on metal? Um, it is a bit slower, yeah. 
Um, the thing is that you know when you start thinking about what kind of metal did they cook on? Well, iron mostly, and it was uh, it wasn't cast iron. Cast iron is post period. Um, it was uh, more of a uh, like forged iron, so they you know you know pound out the uh, iron sheets, rivet them together, and you know form a pot out of it, and they cook in that. The problem with cooking in iron or any uh, uh, of metal, the metals of that sort is that um, it can affect the flavor of the food. Um, I did an experiment a number of years ago where uh, I cooked the same dish in um, pot. I can't remember what I used, whether I used pottery or soapstone. By the way, uh, I, don't know, I don't know. Can you folks see the black pot? This black pot. This one. This is a soap. Really. Uh, maybe you can see the lid now. Yes. Okay, that's a stone pot. Um, they uh, they make soapstone pots in Brazil. I have a Brazilian daughter-in-law, and she brings some home for me every so often. So it's a it's a uh, uh, it's a fun thing to cook with. Um, cooking in soapstone is kind of like having a natural uh, a natural crock pot. You take it off the heat and it keeps on cooking for about another 30 minutes. It really holds the heat. Um, and also, it's naturally non-stick. Nothing sticks to soapstone. Uh, great stuff to cook on. Um, I had uh, somebody uh, uh, who was uh, using soapstone to make pewter molds. You know, try to tell me that, oh, you really shouldn't do that. You'll end up with uh, silicosis from the uh, soapstone grains. You know, there's all kinds of problems. And I said, hmm, let me do some research on that. So I did some poking around, and I found out, well, you know, when you're carving the stuff, that's one thing. But uh, when you're cooking with it, that's something else entirely. And uh, the uh, research that was out there, to indicate that this is really not the problem that you're making it out to be. <laughs> I suppose one of these days it would be interesting to get a really big block of soapstone and try and carve a pot myself. That I would need to wear a mask for. Um, interesting little factoid here. Uh, if you... Um, there's research out there on uh, soap on uh, medieval Islamic uh, soapstone quarries, and they found soapstone quarries in Egypt where there are pots in the process of being made. Uh, really, and some of the some of the pots that they made out of soapstone were enormous. I mean, they were like you know, like two feet by two feet, huge things. I, I kind of look at that and I think to myself, how do you, I mean, how, how do you heat that up in such a way that it doesn't crack? Because soapstone is less easy to work with than pottery. Pottery is a little more, um, uh, particularly if you get the right kind of pottery, pottery is more likely to uh, hold up it's, it's more refractory than soapstone is, maybe the, the technical term. And there's types of clay that they use and types of things that the uh, uh, potters do to uh, make the uh, pottery even more refractory. Uh, like they might add sand to it, they might add uh, pieces of broken pottery to it. Um, one of the common things to do is use this stuff called micaceous clay. It's clay that has a lot of mica in it. Um, and that tends to be very refractory as well. So it, uh, it holds up very well when heating. I'm going to take a taste of this syrup and see how it's doing, see how orangey it's getting, as best as I can tell with my you know, limited sense of taste. Hmm. Mostly sweet, not particularly orangey yet. I think I might need to add a few more uh, bits of orange to this. In fact, uh, I think rather than uh, adding the pulp, 
what I'll do. There are other tricks here. I'm gonna take a little bit of a uh, little bit of cheesecloth. Cut off a section of it. And I'm just going to squeeze out the juice here. Did they use cheese cloth in period? I have no idea. Well, they do. They used it for making cheese. I know that. And if you have any, if you have any conversations with people who are doing the uh, whole uh, cheese making thing, they'll uh, they'll discuss that with you and explain the need for some kind of a cloth bag. Yeah, I talked to Karis Exhibitor about that at some point. Uh, she's a she's a rocking cheese maker, huh? Her cheddar is as good as uh, uh, any store bought stuff that I've uh, that I've had. Okay, let's see what that did to it. Much better. Has some tartness to it. Um, uh, these guys, uh, the uh, Islamic uh, cooks, really, really love their sweet and sour. Um, I have a question. You're just using the pulp and not the skin? Excuse me? You're using just the pulp and not the skin? Not the skin. Okay. Um, the uh, Again, a lot of the uh, recipes that you find that call for, uh, that, uh, call for a sour orange tell you explicitly that the person who peels the thing should be different from the person who juices the thing. Um, because the peel is very bitter. Um, and I found that to be the case with uh, a number of these uh, more exotic uh, 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 exotic citrus fruits. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that uh, the recipe uh, states that you can use citron instead of uh, orange if you wish, if you have some available. Um, citron has a different season. Citron uh, becomes available in the fall, generally, um, around October or so. Um, if you're, uh, you know, if you're familiar with the Jewish holiday of Sukkot, one of the things that is necessary to have to properly celebrate the holiday of Sukkot is a thing called an etrog or an esrog, depending on your Hebrew accent. Um, and uh, esrog or etrog is citron. Um, it's a really interesting fruit. Uh, the ones that you get for uh, uh, religious purposes you know, are, are these beautifully formed and shaped things. And um, this is true of all citrons in my experience. If you pick it up and smell it, it smells like it came out of the Garden of Eden. I mean, it just has this spectacularly, it's a wonderful smell. Um, 
the problem is, is that uh, if you cut open the citron to try and get at the pulp, what you find is that the skin is about one half to three quarters of an inch thick. When you get into the inside of it, there's almost no pulp. Um, people use citron mostly for the rind, not for the pulp. Uh, last uh, last fall, um, my wife was uh, playing around with some uh, marmalade recipes, some period uh, preserves and such, and she was playing around with some of the citrons, with some of the citron-based recipes. So I had some citron pulp to play around with. And like I said, this recipe says you can do it with citron, which I did, and uh, it was uh, it was lovely. It was uh, uh, it was uh, quite a uh, quite tart and sweet at the same time, and it was a very different flavor. Um, some uh, people who study such things, like the origins of uh, of uh, uh, citrus fruits and such um, will often uh, will will often say that uh, citron is as best as they can tell the original citrus fruit. So this is doing nicely here. Um, let me take another taste of the syrup. The syrup I'd say is just about ready to add. Yeah, so I'm going to add it, not all of it, because I think I've got more than I, more than I really need here. So I'm adding about half of it. I, I made a, I made this with three quarters of a cup of sugar and three quarters of a cup of water. So what I'm going to do at this point, you recall I mentioned the uh, use of some uh, coriander seed. I'm going to take care of that. So what I'm adding is maybe about uh, maybe about half a teaspoon or so of, uh, of coriander seed, and I'm uh, have a nice little spice grinder, mortar, and pestle here. And what are the other spices I'm going to add a little bit? Is I'm going to add. Uh, just a bit of saffron, you know, just a, you know, a, a large pinch of saffron. And the way in which I'm going to do it is uh, I'll be uh, adding the saffron to some warm water and letting it sit for a little bit so it uh, extracts the uh, flavor and the aroma and the color. And one of the great things about saffron is that gives everything that you add it to a really lovely golden color. And that's a lot of what it was used for, was uh, to color things as well as to flavor things. And I am going to add a, little, a, a bit of salt to this as well. Um, uh, let's see, which one? Uh, i got to get it from... Uh, the other location here. So I tend to cook with Mediterranean sea salt. Uh, I do not use uh, that very popular uh, stuff, the um, uh, Himalayan pink salt. The reason why I don't use it is because back in the day they knew about that and uh, they considered it to be impure. 
you're going to use uh, the Himalayan salt, and they, they value the Himalayan salt. And, um, they listed the specific place that they were getting their salt from, and it is you know, quite close to the Himalayas. Um, but uh, the uh, kind of salt they wanted was white salt. And you can get white Himalayan salt, and I've gotten a couple pounds of the stuff that I'm slowly working my way through. So, like I said, saffron. Um, About how much salt did you add? What? About how much salt did you add? Oh, maybe about a half a teaspoon or so. Okay. Not a whole lot. You can always add more salt later, but if you add too much salt, you can't get it out. So. So I have this uh, little uh, container of. Uh, Kashmiri saffron that God bless her, my peer gave me many years ago uh, after a, a trip she'd made to India. She came back with uh, uh, the, this little plastic container of, uh, uh, of saffron. Most of the saffron that you can find in the United States is a Spanish saffron. Now, there's, it's not bad, it's just different. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, the the flavor notes are, are a bit different. So like I said, with a little bit of warm water here. And uh, I don't know, can uh, can people see this, what it looks like, what the saffron looks like? Yeah. Okay, so you can see it's uh, these dark red threads. And uh, so I took a, a, a decent sized pinch of it. Uh, I don't know if you can see that in my hand. There's maybe about 20 or 30 threads there. And I'm going to crush them you know, to a powder and then add it to that warm water. And the warm water almost immediately starts to turn yellow. So I don't know if you can see that on camera. Uh, oh, yeah, we can see it. Yeah, yeah. So I'd let that sit for. Uh, Oh, about five minutes or so before I add it in here. Now, uh, meanwhile, I've had the uh, the ferro going for uh, a while. Let's see how that's doing. Getting there. If you've ever had like wheat berry salads or you know, farro as a uh, as a starch, you know it's um these wheat things tend to be kind of crunchy. You know, they they uh, they're resistant against the teeth, but they got a nice flavor. So. So what's happened now is because of the uh, syrup that I've added, this has gone from being something that's being fried to something that's kind of uh, being stewed. And that's kind of what I want. For the cooking experience here. Okay, this is uh, somewhat yellower than it was. 
Hopefully you can see that. Yeah, you can. Hey, Galfridis, have you ever had um, any Iranian uh, saffron? Um, I have not used Iranian saffron. I don't even know where I could find Iranian saffron. Uh, uh, mine came by way of England. One of my friends is uh, married to uh, um, a guy from Iran. Yeah, you, know, you, you, you have to be... Uh, you have to be from a country that has more cordial relations with uh, Iran than we've got. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it is because it's very, very dark. Yeah, yeah. Looking a lot like the one you're using. Yeah, I mean, like the uh, yeah the uh, Spanish saffron. I'll uh, show this. <clears throat> you know the Spanish saffron. It's much lighter. Mm -hmm. See. Yeah. Next time I get some. <laughs> well, I do have, you know, some family connections uh, with uh, uh, South Asia and the Middle East. Uh, my uh, wife's niece is married to an Indian guy. So, uh, you know. They're actually currently living, I think they're currently living in Abu Dhabi. So they, they went there, and it was supposed to be a short trip, and then the global pandemic happened, and now they're kind of stuck there for a while. You could be stuck in worse places. Yeah, you could be, but, you know, <laughs> and they're well off, and, you know, so it's not like it's, you know, necessarily a bad thing, but she's isolated from the rest of her family. I mean, like, uh, what are you going to do? <gasps> okay, so I'm going to add in the saffron water here. And this will uh, just add a nice yellow cast to the uh, the chicken. So, like I said earlier on, this is actually a very simple recipe. It's it's very easy to do. Um, I think it's got real potential as a feast recipe. Um, you just got to make sure you do it at the right time of year. You know, because you're only going to have those Seville oranges for a three-week stretch. You can buy them and hang on to them for a few weeks. I mean, these I purchased, uh, oh, must be about four weeks ago, because it's now three weeks since we really went into lockdown. Um, and I bought these at least a week before then. So, yeah. But, uh, there's a, there's a certain set of recipes I like to play around with that are the easy ones that they're the, they're the ones I look at and say, you know, everybody will like this. You know, this is something that if you want to do a, an absolutely period feast dish, pick something like this because it tastes good. People will like it and they, they, they won't fight with you over it. <laughs> So do uh, folks have uh, any other questions about uh, what, what we're doing here? Like I said, this, this is my family dinner, so uh, we're gonna, at some point in the not-too-distant future, we're going to uh, proceed to the next step in getting dinner set up here. But uh... So would this just be a, a, an average evening dinner for someone from period, or is this like a special occasion kind of meal? Well, the recipe makes it sound like it's really special. I mean, again, listen to what it says. It says, this is an unusual dish. You know, um, maybe, uh, you know, as a result of, uh, you know, living, 
living in the early 21st century, where you can find, uh, particularly in the, this part of the country where I'm from, at least, you know, northern New Jersey, uh, where you can find almost any ethnicity you can imagine, you know, I, I look at this and say, well, I've had a lot of pretty diverse things. This does not seem to be that diverse. But maybe in 13th century Syria, it was something that was unusual and you know, unique. Or it might be just a cook writing off on it. You know, they weren't above doing that. You know, saying, oh, I got this wonderful dish. You know, one, one of the fun things about uh, one of the, uh, or the earliest Islamic cookbook that we have, the uh, uh, Annals of the, the translation is uh, titled Annals of the Caliph's Kitchens. Um, it's a 10th century cookbook. Is about uh, basically almost every chapter, every section that talks about a particular kind of dish ends with a poem about that dish. You know, as the poet has said, this is a marvelous dish and it tastes so wonderful and the colors are marvelous and this is great and that's great and it's good for your health besides, you know, they start citing, you know, humoral theory and that sort of thing. I mean, they're wonderful things. You know, you don't see poetry associated with cookbooks um, when you get into Europe. Huh. But by golly, a seat in the Islamic stuff. <laughs> but yeah, you know, so, you know, th again, this is this is a a dish that uh, I commend to people's attention if they want to uh, experiment with something easy. You know? uh, and you don't have to do it in a pottery dish like what I'm using. You know, a a good non-stick dish will do it as well. Um, I will admit that I have only ever cooked it in pottery, uh, but that's because I'm one of these crazy food and cooking people that's, who's really into the technology as well as the food. Um, so partly, partly, I guess, I guess I think it makes a difference. You know, what you cook something in has an impact on how the thing comes out in the final analysis. Um, metal does different things in pottery. In fact, uh, my entry drug to the whole world of medieval Islamic cooking was uh, there was an article in the New York Times about uh, 12, 13 years ago on uh, cooking tagines. I said, okay, well, that's cool. I'll go out and buy one. Uh, and I got it for my wife as a uh, Christmas present, I think. Um, and uh, from that point on, I was messing around with crazy stuff with a thing. Oh, well, what happens if I do this? What happens if I do this? How about this? How about this? Uh, and then, um, then I went up to uh, uh, the Culinary Institute of America and used their library and found a whole bunch of medieval cookbooks. And yeah, yeah, uh, that that was the end. Or the beginning. Definitely the beginning. Definitely the beginning. Definitely the beginning. I'm going to take a taste of the sauce. So this sauce now has the coriander, the sugar, and the chicken flavors in it. Even with my somewhat muted sense of taste, there's some lovely stuff going on in there. Especially the sweet and sour thing. I might add just a few drops of lemon juice to get a little bit more tartness out of it, though. Because for whatever reason, the particular uh, Seville orange I picked was one of the sweeter ones. You, know, you never know what you're going to get. Let me see what happens if I uh, 
And, you know, I'll just throw out a few other comments about sweet and sour. There are, are dishes that were made with vinegar in them. Um, there are dishes that were made with uh, uh, sour grape juice, often referred to as verjuice. Um, there are dishes that are made with uh, pomegranate juice, um, which in period was not hugely sweet. Um, there are dishes made with a stuff called sumac. Uh, now, if you're driving down the road, you might see the staghorn sumacs, the ones with the red spikes on them. Um, it's basically that stuff, and that's a, a malic acid flavor. So there's lots of interesting sweet and sour things you can play around with. And uh, this is just one of them. So again, uh, any, uh, any further questions any, uh, that uh, people might have? We're uh, past the hour. I mean, I'll hang out here for as long as people want me to hang out. But at this point, you know, it, the comment that I made to uh, uh, that I made earlier to you was uh, you know, applies here. At this point, it begins to be kind of like watching paint dry. You know? <laughs> um, have you ever made this without with, with, in, with skin skinless chicken pieces? Uh, um, I have not. Um, I find that, that the chicken browns more nice, more nicely, and you get the uh, get uh, more of the nice flavor of the chicken fat from the skin. Um, now, when I cut up the chicken, I trim off a, a lot of extraneous fat, so there's less skin and less fat in here than you might find otherwise. Um, but uh, uh, I tend to prefer cooking with the skin rather than without the skin. Right? And, I, and, I, and I, I get it. It has less fat to remove the skin. But it also has less flavor. You know? mm. so one of the things about fat is that fat carries flavor. Um, you know, I remember a, a, a friend of mine used to work for Nabisco. And he made the comment about the snack, Nabisco snack well cakes. Which are you know low fat and all that kind of thing. So the problem with them being low fat is they're also low flavor. <laughs> you know? um, and also one of the things that fat does is it makes you feel full. So people would end up eating, you know, like binging on these snack well cakes because they weren't feeling full because there's no fat in them. That makes you feel full. You know? um, Maybe there's something to that whole Mediterranean diet thing, you know? <laughs> which has a fair bit of fat in it, actually. <laughs> so how will you know when the chicken's done? It looks done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm an experienced cook. I kind of look at it and say, yeah, it looks pretty good here. I mean, there were some pink spots in it, and the pink spots are pretty much gone. Um, you know, I'd like it to brown a little more, uh, but I don't want to overcook it as well because then it'll dry out, especially the breast pieces will dry out. Um, one of the things that I do is I, when I'm cutting up a chicken, okay, so typically you cut a chicken up into, you can cut a chicken up into eight pieces fairly easily. So you take the leg quarters, you cut them into the leg and the thigh. You take the breast quarters, you cut them into the wing and the breast. I do another cut on the breast. I cut the breast into two into two pieces because even with the smaller chickens, the breasts are huge. You know, but they're just big. So I don't want that big a piece. You don't really need that big a piece. Um, and also, it cooks it cooks more quickly when you're doing it that way as well. Um, better for serving and uh, uh, better for cooking. You know, just in my experience. Uh, recently, I made something, uh, you know, sort of, you know, along similar lines, but I did it with, uh, I did it with a duck. And again, I cut the duck up into fairly small pieces. Now, duck is really fatty. Um, 
and uh, you were actually exposed. The recipe actually depended on the fattiness of the duck. Um, uh, it came out really nice too. Uh, I was impressed with how with how well it came out. So, any other questions? Right, shall we wrap this up? Uh, Does anyone else have any questions about this? Um, if anybody wants the full uh, bibliographic information on the cookbook, I mean, I've given the author and the title, so that should be enough. Uh, I can uh, post that somewhere. You know, on the uh, I, I, I can post it uh, as a you know reply to uh, the uh, posting on this class or something like that. <laughs> but it's published by New York University Press. Came out uh, a couple years ago. One of the nice things about it is, uh, I'll just show it on screen for just a bit, is you've got the English on one page and the Arabic on another page. So uh, if you if you want, you can compare it. You can com you can do your own little translation notes. Which, uh, yes, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> I admit it. I well, I wonder how we translate. I wonder what this word is translated from. Ah, okay. I understand now why he says to do that. So anyway, but I, I, I will post that bibliographic information. Would you happen to have the ISBN number on that? Um, I do. Uh, is there some way that I can type it in? So we can type it into chat. Okay, let me, oops. I just, uh, there we go. So where's chat here? Um, so there should be an icon in your upper right that looks like a text box. Okay. Yeah, I see it. Got it. Okay. So um, the ISBN is uh, 978-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-